The year is 1965. American soldiers arrive in what was then South Vietnam. It's the beginning of America's ill-starred war in Southeast Asia. In the coming years, the world's greatest military power was to launch an all-out assault on the communist guerrilla forces of this small country. They had never come across an enemy like it. The guerrillas would appear as if from nowhere. The inspiration behind this extraordinary army, a small, frail and elderly man called Ho Chi Minh. We will never, never submit to aggressive force. We will fight to the end. He was to become an international figure of hate and admiration. But who was this mysterious man who inspired not just his own soldiers, but a generation of young people around the world? Chi Minh was born in 1890 in what was then known as French Indochina, a large slice of Southeast Asia. It was a French colony. The population worked on the large French-owned rubber plantations. Men were cheaper than machines and the local population was conscripted into work gangs. There were frequent rebellions which were brutally put down. Ho Chi Minh, the son of a prosperous civil servant, witnessed many of them. As he grew up, he became frustrated by the lack of opportunity and indignant at the treatment of his people. In 1911, he went to sea and travelled the world working as a ship's cook. In London, he worked as a dishwasher. In Paris, for a photographer. It was in France in 1918 that he heard about a revolution in Russia. The Russian Revolution offered hope and inspiration to millions of people living under foreign colonial rule. The reason the Russian Revolution had such an impact on peoples in the colonial world was that they saw the Russian people creating a completely new type of regime. And I think that gave people in that period, in the 20s and 30s, a lot of hope because they said if the Russians can do it against their own rulers, we can surely do it against foreign rulers. Ho became a communist. He went to Moscow to learn about Marxist revolutionary politics and was then sent to Southeast Asia as a communist agent. There he lived a cloak and dagger existence flitting between China, the British colony of Hong Kong and French Indochina. He was to become the most important communist agent in Southeast Asia. In 1930 he set up the Indochinese Communist Party. He had certain political skills. He could move around, he could inspire people. He wasn't a great orator, but he was a fantastic organizer. And these organizational skills led him to become the foremost leader of the Vietnamese Communist Party. In 1939, World War II broke out. France was occupied by Germany and the colonial administration in Indochina collapsed. By the end of the war, there was no effective control in the region. In 1945, Ho Chi Minh declared Vietnamese independence. I remember the day very well. It was sunny. 
About one million people had assembled in the center of Hanoi to listen to the Declaration of Independence by the President Ho Chi Minh. Then he paused and asked the crowd, Did you hear me? And everybody said, Yes! We had regained our independence. But it was not to be. When the governments of the victorious allies divided up the world, the French lost the colony they'd called Indochina, but regained control of the part now called Vietnam. Ho was forced to sign a peace accord with the French, which to all intents and purposes reaffirmed Vietnam as a French colony. He gathered his supporters for another guerrilla war. It was a bad settlement which created an uneasy peace. Below the tranquil surface, tensions ran deep. As the French re-established their authority, the Vietnamese resisted. Within a year, in 1947, Ho was back in the mountains with an army of guerrilla fighters preparing for a long and bloody anti-colonial war. Communist Russia and China backed Ho's guerrilla army. The USA and Europe backed France with words and more. The American Secretary of State, a cold warrior by the name of John Foster Dulles, asked the French, do you wish to use nuclear weapons to bomb this army of termites which is advancing to you? The French refused, mercifully for us. The climax of the war came in 1954 when the Vietnamese laid siege to a French military base at Dien Bien Phu. The siege lasted for 55 days. 3,000 crack French paratroopers were dropped in to help. The Vietnamese were led by a brilliant young general called Vo Nguyen Giap, who marshaled the Vietnamese forces and improvised supply lines using bicycles to bring in arms and food. We advanced little by little. We were able to cut the road around Dien Bien Phu. Then we assembled our forces and advanced little by little and surrounded the French. To the astonishment of the world, and particularly the French, the Vietnamese won a decisive victory. 16,000 French troops were either killed or captured. It was the end of the French Empire in Southeast Asia. France sued for peace. Once again, Ho proclaimed Vietnamese independence. We are asking for national support to destroy the enemy. We are asking everybody to work hard to win victory. The clapping and cheers are echoed throughout the country. The power of the people can move mountains and it can destroy the enemy. It was a nasty moment for America, who now began to worry that communism would spread to the rest of Southeast Asia. America feared that like dominoes, one country after another would fall to communist guerrillas. In July 1954 in Geneva, a peace deal was hammered out to minimize the danger. There'd be a two-year ceasefire during which Vietnam would be divided in two a communist north and a republic in the south. Then there would be free elections on both sides of the border to decide the future of Vietnam. 
these elections never took place and President Eisenhower of the United States gave a very clear answer to that. He said the reason we didn't permit elections to take place in Vietnam was because we were worried that if they took place, 90% of the population would vote for Ho Chi Minh. The border became permanent. Bridges along it were never repaired. The world powers had once again cheated the Vietnamese of their victory. A pro-American anti-communist president called No Din Diem was installed in the South, and Ho Chi Minh, worn down by years of war, had to settle for half of the country he'd fought for, the People's Republic of North Vietnam. In the newly created North Vietnam, there was peace for the first time in 15 years. Ho Chi Minh set about building a new communist society. Russia and China were the models. There was a massive and brutal redistribution of land. The big plantations and farms were broken up and land parceled out to some 8 million landless peasants. Landlords became figures of hate, symbols of all that was bad about the old society. We had to find in each village two or three landlords who were, as it were, reactionaries and shoot them so that the class consciousness of the peasants would be heightened. For this reason, we shot about 10,000 people. Despite the ruthless suppression of political opponents, Uncle Ho, as he became known, remained a popular figure. He was seen throughout the two Vietnams as a great patriot who dedicated his life to the country. The border dividing the north from the south became a source of mounting tension, dividing families, friends and communities. Ho began to exploit these feelings. He sent communist agents to the south to agitate for national reunification. They were well received, particularly in the rural areas where Ho's memory was still revered. The South Vietnamese regime, decadent, sleazy, and increasingly dominated by America, began to collapse in the face of a widespread popular desire for reunification. America saw its buffer zone against communism falling apart. In 1965, the United States sent in troops to prop it up. They landed at a place called Da Nang. The American generals had promised a short war which would flush out the communists in the south and teach North Vietnam a sharp lesson. Ho Chi Minh feared what might happen. He was very anxious because how could we take on the Americans? She was the biggest power in the world. Her soldiers were bigger and stronger than ours. Well equipped, well exercised, well trained. So he gave the order that we should investigate which tactics would help us fight the Americans. And finally, our generals found the solution. We should make the Americans fight on our terms. The Vietnamese depended on surprise and speed. Their aim was to get in close, destroy the target and get out quickly. Our slogan was, grab the enemy by the belt to fight him. Those were the words of Ho Chi Minh. 
It was surprisingly effective. The Americans responded with ever greater firepower. Troop numbers rose to half a million. American aircraft dropped more bombs than during the entire period of World War II. They took a terrible toll on the Vietnamese people. Yet, to everybody's amazement, North Vietnam did not collapse. The country turned its villages into mini fortresses capable of withstanding the most devastating air raids. Only afterwards, when film like this was seen, did people in the rest of the world realize how ingenious the North Vietnamese had become at living through the bombardments. A system of tunnels under the villages enabled people to survive against all the odds. Ho, by now an old man, continued to be the inspiration for his people. American imperialism is the aggression. It must stop if air attacks on the north. It must put an end of its aggression in the south. Withdraw these troops from South Vietnam and let the Vietnamese people settle by themselves their own affairs. In the West, Ho Chi Minh became a symbol of how a small country can stand up for itself. But by the late 1960s, Ho's health was fading. In 1969, he died at the age of 79. When Ho Chi Minh died, everybody cried. Everybody. Little children to old men loved him and everybody was very sad, very sad. It was a great loss to the nation. It was odd because for a whole week it rained. It was as if the sky itself sensed it had lost something and was crying for this loss. Ho was never to see what he'd spent his life fighting for. But five years later, in 1973, the USA decided that 50,000 dead Americans was too many. The soldiers went home, leaving South Vietnam to defend itself. Two years later, in May 1975, the US government pulled out its remaining advisors and the North Vietnamese entered Saigon, capital of the South. They were to rename it Ho Chi Minh City. Six years after his death, Ho's dream of an independent, united Vietnam came true. 